Hello and welcome. After 13 games, Carlton had only scored above 83 times. Two of those against the currently bottom two sides in the league. Since then, Carlton have scored upwards of 95 every game and have done so with Charlie and Harry not kicking more than three each in these games. Today, we deconstruct Carlton's simple way of scoring more with their key forwards kicking less. The basis for discussion today surfaces from this image. From our 21 scoring shots to three quarter time against Gold Coast, goals were in abundance in this region. Smack bang in front, suggesting the very common perception that kicking straight in front usually results in success. Whilst we weren't so successful with shots further out or on angles, it reflects a stat that in our last four weeks, we've been first for goals per inside 50 percentage wise and third for goal kicking accuracy, despite being dead last in both categories for the five weeks prior. And it continued into this game as we went at 30%, seven percentile points above league average and higher than league leaders Adelaide by 3% on the back of scoring in high percentage areas. Nine of our seven goals in the first half coming from inside 30 meters. Here's how it was done. It's been headlined by work rate, a new smarter take on the game, a lot of running and support, an ability to lock the ball in our forward half. This is the region I'm referring to that resembles success in the Suns game. Now, to get there, it required having clear possession in what I'll call zone one and in this area zone two. Now, if we regain possession in zone one, the losing streak Carlton kicks this ball over zone two or goes wide. The Carlton of the weekend takes that extra move to get it into zone two, whether that's off a handball receive, a short pass or other means, eliminating that long kick. That can be reflected in our percentages of kicking long and our corridor usage in recent weeks. Then the entry can be sent deeper and into an area of higher priority in zone three. So the message here is patience takes precedence and that simplicity prevails. Now I wanna quickly demonstrate what happens with entries that don't prioritize these zones. With this example, Kemp has taken the intercept, but we don't take the short kick to zone two, we skip right to zone three. And so the kick can't reach that prime position we want. And it's much easier for Essendon to cover as we've limited the areas we can get to by skipping over. We can also see it in the port game itself through the lens of the opposition. Boyd has been incredibly damaging here to divert Rosie's kick outside of zone three. And so despite getting possession, they've closed themselves off by kicking it into that pocket. And so Carlton numbers can roll over and converge unbothered if they leave a port player open because their direct matchup is borderline unreachable from that position. It means Lord has to take a bit longer to possess the footy to bypass one of ours to get it to the open man, which has given McGovern a window to nail the tackle. You can see on this example, McGovern, as per his follow through, pulls the kick lower at the last second to hit Mackay which is probably just outside that hotspot I was talking about. You'll see the re-entry comes from that 55 to 75 meter zone, and it hits that perfect spot where it's tough to rush it from that far out, irrespective of the defender. Dersma trying to knock it over the line embodies that. The uniqueness here is you don't have any Carlton Smalls nearby, so you're actually backing Port's taller players to do the roving to cancel out danger. And that's where we exploited it to score the goal. For Jack's second, it's very similar. Nick Newman takes it in that region fit for hitting the goal square, and his kick hits basically the same spot. However, this time, you've got Harry who dictates his matchup with Aaliyah because of the space made here, which leaves Aaliyah needing to be accountable. And Charlie's wedged himself between Jonas and the contest. So that leaves Jack Silvani picking up Miles Bergman, who's way too comfortable given the circumstances and he finds himself responsible for the goal conceded here. Here's one where the ball slingshots back in after a spoil. You see us clogging the corridor and holding a position centrally to gain possession in zone two, right in that prime area to attack the square. The forward pressure by Motts forces it out in the pocket. And whilst the ball has ended up out of play, thus outside of prime position, forcing a dead ball means it's getting thrown back right into zone three which means it's a good environment for your smalls to score from, or if you get a free kick, it's a great place for a set shot. Like this example for Cripper, 
or on this example for JSOS where we heap pressure on port, force it out into the same pocket, get a free in roughly the same spot, and get the same result. Here is something we were devoid of for a lifetime. Taking a mark here can give the view that a down the line kick is imminent as you wait for numbers. But this kick is constructive. It's dangerous. But the fact we've flooded this region with running halfbacks means you should be able to retain possession regardless of the outcome of the kick. And that's how this one ended up. In doing so, our numbers have progressed forward and we've advanced it into a more central part. Then we just use the formula of before. Kemp goes from zone one to zone two with carry and he gets it to zone three, where the Motlop contest has a similar dynamic to a couple of sequences ago. The port defender is running backward, thus disadvantaged whilst Motts is facing the ball and can dictate the play, or whilst the extra number for port is nowhere to be found. This play's been on repeat for time, but let's look deeper. Charlie's obviously higher up the ground and Jack Martin has received it here, which has meant Jonas and Aaliyah are not occupying space in the 50, which is why the switch is so effective. We get it to a better position in zone two and the ball moves faster than the man. So picking that contest is smart, not only for the fact it's in the hot zone, but it's yet again highlighting Port's vulnerability aerially with Jonas and Aaliyah too far away. Cottrell is goal side the whole possession, which is an error on Burgoyne's part, and his positioning is indicative of a player who's read the personnel and what that means for where the ball lands. And a goal follows. Center bounces were another source for positive outcomes with Carlton being number one in scoring margin from center clearance chains since round 12. That extra number off halfback not only aided those deep entries, but also provided a foundation for those attacking midfielders to be really aggressive with a bit of insurance covering their run forward. And courtesy of 666 and our structure, we also had Charlie incredibly isolated in that hot zone, especially with Harry Mackay out. In this instance, we obtain possession in zone one and Cunningham has broken loose from his number, which means we can enter zone two, ready to springboard us into that prime position. Charlie was grouse on the day as we've seen already, impacting the play greatly, despite not registering a score himself. He does get a bit of jumper, but he's fending off Aaliyah, eliminating any chance of verticality for him to approach the drop of the ball, whilst Charlie is also simultaneously providing a soft drop for Jesse Motlop, whose opponent does nothing but clean up a guy who's already had a stranglehold on the possession. We get a bit of luck with the bounce, but Motts stayed level-headed and we convert. I just love how the default thing to do is send it to zone three. Charlie again, I think was making the conscious decision to play one-on-one -on -one whilst he was stationary to eliminate Aaliyah's intercept ability with the belief he could outmuscle him. If the ball hit the ground, Aaliyah being neutralized means Jonas is sent into the deep end, having not played AFL for weeks, needing to patrol JSOS at ground level. With so much space, the goal square intentionally left open and the ball going over the back, because of Port's lack of representation aerially, it basically means JSOS was destined to score on this possession. I also loved Cripper's game. I thought his work in contested situations was strong. The quick hands here activates an entry on the edge of zone three, and Charlie does a repeat of his work in eliminating Aaliyah's presence to aid Motts. Lockie Jones had a stinker here. I cannot say I know why he's left Motts unattended with plenty of space for small forwards to roam, but we don't complain and we move. This one follows on with Cripper's work, who's pretty intelligent and aware with his handballs here to maximize our numbers at the forefront of the contest. And Walsh's kick hits that spot again. Good thing is if the mark isn't taken, it's at a distance where rushing it isn't an option. And the smalls can go to work to keep it internally in that high percentage zone. You see a perfect example of that happening through JSOS affecting the initial handball, Fogg applying the tackle, and how fruitful that pressure can be through Cottrell. Now for a little bit of a segment from our special guest, one of the best AFL analysts YouTube has ever seen. Pommy and Oz, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much to Saba for allowing me to uh, guest on his show. Make sure you have hit the like and subscribe button to his channel. He's an absolute wonderful human being and some great content. And we're here today to talk about an unsung hero who had an absolute terrific game this week. Nick Newman, uh, game high nine tackles, 23 touches going at 78%. 
Seven of them contested the nine score involvements, seven intercepts. He took his goal well, and he's been a sensational in this recent turnaround. We're going to look at his game in depth through the dark patches and to now, and what his role has slightly changed. And it's really interesting that he's playing more of the Doherty role. And what we're going to do is look at his raw data. So these are his numbers going through round 8 and 13. And you can see the increase to the output is huge. Interesting enough, he is top two for marks in his position in the league, which is sensational. He's increased his score launches by 50%. Meters gained per disposal is a massive change a lot more run and stun from him a lot more distance by foot with the ball and a real hunger to attack the ball meters gained is an incredible incredible rise and he's kind of playing an almost behind the ball kind of like that defensive like a cdm in soccer and let's take a look at his heat map that shows you from them early rounds round eight through to the round 13 he was played really deep. In the last four rounds, you can see his average position on the ground is higher. And it's interesting of how they operate in the stoppage and the clearance. And what you'll see here is we've got this footage. And what I want to show you here, particularly for round clearance, this is where it's been a big thing. And you can see here, as we pause it, his first movement is to bring it to ground. And you can see how high up he has been. And this is through stoppages. And they've trialled Boyd, um, Doherty, and now they've settled with Newman, being that guy that is going to be at the fall of that dump ball. Now, I want you to watch, and this is just one footage from this weekend, Blake Akers' his first movement. So Blake Akers will come into this contest and he's already going into that defensive position and he will stay behind Nick Newman throughout this play. And it's very akin to Gary Neville and David Beckham where they would overlap run. Now, it was interesting that when you used to watch them play, they would always slot behind each other when one of them went and overlapped. And overlap is a key phrase. And I want you to watch the overlaps that are created here. Nick Newman handballs the ball ahead. And look, they're looking for the runners and players running ahead. And Nick Newman is going to pop up just in your screen here. And he's, he's still racing ahead. He's creating that outlet ball. He has gone into the center again for that clearance out the back, should it go. And what this does is with this run and stun pattern, with these guys overlapping each other, short, sharp handballs and running together, you get these wonderful deep entries. And look at this deep entry here. It creates a one out. And Jack Martin's too clever. And if you go back and watch my review video, we discussed this. And with Sabah's complimentary footage, he's talked about how deeper entries create. And it makes it easier to score. Carlton now are averaging nearly 70% of their shots in the last four rounds in the higher echelon of conversion rate for the AFL as a norm. Nick Newman will be probably in the top four of Carlton's BNF at the end of the year. And a sensational return to form for Nick Newman. Thank you very much. Pommy and Oz out. Thanks for that, Pom. Blake Akers, I thought, was really instrumental, especially in the second, in helping intercept and promoting this carry we had. Weeks ago, he looked really timid, but he only knew one direction this game, and that was forward. And one mindset, and that was to be assertive. While she gets it into zone two, and his kick is also stupidly precise, to the well-protected side of Cunners and in the midst of zone three. You'll see it again from Akers here to get us into zone two. It's a pity we held such a high line because the following step may have seemed a bit clearer for Charlie, or he could have also been on the end of one in zone three. But the art of forward pressure means that we actually can generate more of these higher percentage opportunities by forcing them in zone two and rebounding it into zone three, like this example and many more we've showcased today. Here's another excellent bit of Charlie work. Back tapping it to JSOS has inadvertently sucked in an extra port defender and allowed more numbers to get ahead of the ball carrier, as we've gone back momentarily, whilst there's also the counter punch of numbers going forward. We've got the work rate of Walsh here, allowing that handball on the 90 we cried out for weeks ago to change that angle again and keep the momentum running. Whilst that has also sucked in Houston, who has to cover the Walsh run, the only guy capable of reaching and responsible for Cunningham. So yet again, we've got the collection of footy in zone one, a colossal hand pass to zone two, and a kick to zone three, which couldn't be any more advantageous. This sort of sums up the development of our structure. 
getting a mark out wide and slowly funneling your way in as you progress from zone to zone. Charlie marks at zone one. The kick takes the direction required to enter zone two and be able to reach zone three. Yet again, you've got the winger, like that Cottrell example earlier, sitting out back where the ball reaches. Though this one isn't as fortuitous as the others, but it's yet again in a dangerous spot where even in congestion, you're able to make shit happen. There you have it. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that if you're getting the ball into high percentage areas for a score, you're gonna score more and you're gonna convert truly more often. Carlton have emphasized getting it to this area in recent weeks, but I think it's the versatility in how we've gotten there that has made us so much more damaging, irrespective of who's involved. No team is an easy matchup, but no team is unbeatable. We play like this, we can beat anyone. Huge thanks to Pom for his cameo today. He provides the analysis and Carlton content he's given us today on his channel, Pommy and Oz on YouTube, which you can find in the description. Support's been awesome recently. Let's keep it going and uh, share this one around if you think it's worth it. We'll see you next week for round 19 analysis. Thank you again. Bye for now.